Uh, today I'll be speaking uh, about uh, uh, establishing a pain diagnosis. Uh, again, uh, the disclosures as mentioned, uh, I will uh, likely uh, mention uh, uh, treatments, uh, not specifically, but uh, we may be off-label, uh, and this recognizes the fact that much of pain treatment uh, best practice has a limited uh, or at best, uh, at best limited uh, but really no uh, strong uh, chronic uh, uh, outcome for a randomized controlled trial. So uh, six objectives very briefly is that uh, diagnosis of, quote, chronic pain uh, is not an adequate diagnosis uh, for treatment planning. Uh, we will review and you would be able to systematically characterize painful conditions based on duration, type, and location. Recognize commonly presenting chronic pain conditions uh, following a structured approach to diagnosis. And uh, as ever important uh, as we make uh, clear every session uh, that there are often uh, very important co-occurring behavioral health disorders uh, and predictors uh, that may even speak to potential abuse and addiction. Uh, and that if clinical presentation changes, uh, we need to do a reevaluation uh, that uh, people's lives move forward and chronic uh, diseases uh, can uh, be manifested by new acute situations uh, and the need, uh, of course, to counsel uh, patients and caregivers about treatment side effects. So I'm making a first reference to the Washington Administrative Code and for those in Washington State, uh, uh, this is the law, the opiate law, and there is a specific descriptor here of the patient evaluation. Uh, it's on page two to three of the Washington Administrative Code. Uh, and uh, I think uh, if you just take a quick look at the slide, uh, you can basically see there's really nothing astonishing here. And in fact, this would be, uh, uh, in, from a medical student's perspective, uh, 101 patient evaluation. Take a history, do a physical exam. Uh, and since we're referring to pain, identify current and past treatments for pain. Uh, what perhaps differs some, uh, not here at the university because we make a big fuss over this, uh, that uh, the effect of pain on physical and psychological function is very, very important. Uh, and this is not part of, of uh, national standards of uh, evaluation, but is critically important in this state. This is what the Washington regulations require. And in your risk screening, uh, for comorbidities, uh, you address uh, history of addiction, aberrant behaviors uh, relative to opioids, regular use of benzos, alcohol, or other CNS sedating drugs, a receipt of opioids for more than one provider or group, i.e., check the prescription monitoring program, and evaluate whether there are, there are repeated emergency department visits to seeking opioids, which would be referred to your patient care agreement. Presence of sleep apnea. And the health record should include a diagnosis, a treatment plan, objectives of your treatment plan, in other words, what your goals of that treatment are, indications for the pain medications, results are documented based on your periodic review, and then you provide instructions to the patient. And this really should apply to any condition we treat, uh, but specifically called out in Washington State. Uh, so. Again, by way of de just general definitions, I'm sure review for uh, uh, all of us uh, participating today that acute pain means it's a recent onset. Recent means less than 90 days. Uh, it is transient. By definition, acute means it comes and goes, uh, which means we expect a resolution. Typically, acute pain, uh, we can find an identifiable cause, uh, and our treatment goal is cure because body will heal, as attributed to Voltaire, uh, nature heals, uh, physicians get the credit. Uh, and this certainly applies to acute pain. Uh, chronic pain, much more complicated. Uh, it, by definition, is longstanding, uh, lots of variations, but uh, I think the greater than 90-day rule uh, can apply. Other definitions call for uh, beyond expected, and I don't know what expected means because that's totally subjective. So the objective measure is more than 90 days. It extends beyond the usual course of injury. Importantly, tissue injury need not be present or active. And when pain becomes a disease, it is far more complicated. It's more than just a symptom uh, of a previous biomedical event, uh, but it is uh, driven by psychosocial environmental factors and the patient's quality of life 
uh, often does not correlate to the severity of the pathophysiology. And our treatment goals are to improve function and quality of life. Uh, by way of diagnosis, it's very helpful to describe nociceptive pain if it is present. This is the specific definition of nociceptive pain. It arises from actual or threatened, so we don't even have to have damage, but the threat of damage can trigger nociceptive pain to non-neural tissue and is due to the activation of nociceptors, the free nerve endings that introduce uh, the noxious, protective damage, danger signal into the central nervous system. It's characteristically aching, throbbing, dull, sharp, cutting, or gnawing, is as patients may describe it. It's associated with injuries, infection, and inflammation, a musculoskeletal, spine, visceral, and headache, uh, which includes migraine. Uh, the nociceptor there is the trigeminal ganglion, uh, temporomandibular disorders, dental factors, and cervicogenic, uh, arising from the neck. Uh, neuropathic pain differs, very important, because our treatments uh, are different for the management and our expectations of outcome differ, and the disease states that cause these are also different. Very simply, uh, it is pain caused by a lesion or disease of the somatosensory nervous system. Uh, it is described burning, tingling, electrical, stabbing, pins and needles. The phenomenon of temporal summation is often present. That means by repeated light stimulation of uh, a patient with neuropathic pain, rather than diminishing inten uh, of intensity of pain, uh, which a normal uh, neurologic system does, i.e. repetitive light tapping on the back of your hand, if you just do this on your own, uh, uh, dorsal hand, you will notice that it feels less and less. A patient with neuropathic pain, it will feel more and more. And it may present with associated autonomic features. This is one of my criticisms of the ISP working group diagnosis because very commonly neuropathic pain generated from visceral structures uh, will have nausea, vomiting, uh, and uh, other autonomic features uh, present. Uh, neuropathic pain can be focal i.e. Uh, herpetic uh, outbreak of, uh, of uh, shingles. Uh, it can be associated with an entrapment syndrome uh, or could be trigeminal neuralgia or be more widespread, more widespread uh, as we see in polyneuropathies related to metabolic, uh, nutritional, IB12 deficiencies, folate deficiencies uh, related to diabetes, uh, medication-related, particularly HIV-associated drugs and chemotherapeutic drugs, toxin-related, um, mercury heavy metals, uh, hereditary uh, neuropathic pain, neoplastic and paraneoplastic causes, and uh, infectious causes. There are central neuropathic pain syndromes, multiple sclerosis, for instance. Central means of or pertaining to the central nervous system, not the peripheral nervous system, or spinal cord injuries, uh, and others like uh, low, uh, low back pain with radiculopathy, which has mixed features and uh, complex regional pain syndrome, otherwise known as RSD in former nosen, uh, uh, nomenclature, uh, uh, that are characteristic of neuropathic pain. Visceral pain is a consequence of a diseased organ. Uh, its characteristics are differently described, sickening, dull, squeezing, deep, very difficult uh, to locate for patients, uh, and they can often refer to a somatic site. So a visceral pain can refer to the abdominal wall, particularly chronically, uh, uh, when it's chronically present. The viscera have uh, not just one dermatomal input, but two plus a connection to the autonomic nervous system. Uh, hence, it's more diffuse presentation, and uh, as a result of its frequent connection to the vagal system, nausea, vomiting uh, uh, may also be part of the syndrome. Uh, acute visceral pain syndromes, ischemic cardiac disease, pneumonia, pulmonary emboli, you can read the list. Basically, a, a disease or injury to one of the visceral structures. Uh, chronic visceral pain, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, interstitial cystitis, chronic pelvic pain are common visceral syndromes uh, of, uh, that uh, we encounter in uh, ordinary practice. Uh, there's also acute on-chronic, uh, which would mean uh, the 
process is chronic, but the active disease state appears periodically, like inflammatory bowel disease or recurrent pancreatitis. And one would expect acute on chronic uh, to produce central nervous system windup, leaving a neuropathic central sensitization phenomenon with acute activity that is often nociceptive superimposed on that process. Uh, fibromyalgia, and I have an antique a descriptor there, uh, which is a tender point exam, which is no longer necessary. In fact, the 2011 recommendations for fibromyalgia uh, include a body diagram uh, that has 19 points that the patient points to, a uh, description of fatigue, uh, sleep uh, uh, being unrestful, and the uh, 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 presence of uh, a, a cognitive impairment, i.e. fibro fog, which you see in the old-fashioned description. I leave this up here because this is what most of us have been trained with, and I personally still find it useful to do the fibromyalgia exam, uh, and I do this exam on my patients with uh, chronic opioid exposure uh, as a measure of opioid-induced hyperalgesia, which is not evidence-based, and I'm still waiting the time and uh, the horsepower to be able to uh, generate a study. We're thinking of collaborating with Mayo Clinic to compare their very expensive uh, uh, quantitative sensory testing with my bedside exam, which, de which deals with these tender points. Uh, uh, I will next time update that slide and put the new uh, graphic description, which appears in JAMA, and we have this at our site right now. It is posted at the Pain Provider Toolkit, uh, which will give that representation. I apologize for not updating these. Uh, uh, widespread pain disorders, uh, otherwise known as central sensitization, uh, this is from Muhammad Yunus's uh, uh, publication from 2007, and you can note here, he's a rheumatologist, this is fibromyalgia, commonly associates with chronic fatigue syndrome, but post-traumatic stress disorder, chronic bladder pain syndromes, pelvic pain syndromes, multiple chemical sensitivities, restless leg and periodic leg movement syndromes, myofascial pain, temporomandibular uh, pain syndromes, migraine, tension, headache, and irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, this is the dreaded positive review of systems, which I embrace because this allows me to make a diagnosis of central sensitization, and we can get a running start on managing our patients. And all of these are treated the same way. So instead of being way more complicated than you like it to be, it actually simplifies your understanding of when patients have a widespread pain disorder. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lozier, uh, Professor Meredith here, I, I credit him to this onion uh, in part because uh, patients with chronic pain uh, make you cry when you first see them, when you first cut into that onion, but the longer you cook them in your practice and spend time with them, the sweeter they become. Uh, and here's nociception is detection of tissue damage. Pain is a response to nociception, but the experience is generated in the brain and spinal cord. Uh, you need a brain to have pain, uh, and uh, it is independent of nociception. The diminishment of one's capacity is suffering. It is not pain, because people can have an extraordinary nociceptive activity, plenty of suffering, and it may not be expressed as pain per se. And what we see is the behavior, what a, your patient does or doesn't do that they ascribe to the presence of damage, which may not be present. Uh, the other co-occurring disorders, which I alluded to earlier, uh, of, of the behavioral health are extremely important to evaluate. Anxiety, which in our clinic, a one-year analysis of our pain tracker data that we have electronically uh, identified over 35% presence of anxiety disorder uh, in our patients. Depression, a prevalence of 55%. Uh, of our patients presenting with depression. Uh, so the two top questions of the GAD-7 and the two top questions of the PHQ-9 become the PHQ-4. So that's a four-question assessment that includes anxiety and depression. And if these scores are elevated, we reflex to a PTSD a questionnaire, and about 30% of our patients have PTSD as they present in our pain clinic here, an underappreciated and underrepresented co-occurring diagnosis, which, as we rec you may recall, is a precursor for developing widespread pain syndromes and is 
most commonly erroneously treated uh, with benzos and uh, opioids uh, for the existential suffering associated with PTSD as well. Uh, sleep disorders, very important as a co-occurring diagnosis. We consider this critical at the University of Washington to be identify pain initiation problems and pain uh, in interference with main sleep maintenance problems. So we do a zero to 10 survey of pain interference with sleep and we assess the co-occurring condition of obstructive sleep apnea, not central, but obstructive sleep apnea with the stop bang, snore, tired, obstructed breathing, elevated blood pressure. Very quick to assess this. Obesity, age above 60, neck collar size in men above 17 inches, uh, uh, and gender being male, add the sensitivity but the, just the stop alone will allow you to identify obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, central sleep apnea requires a sleep study to make the diagnosis and would also be a significant consideration in any high-risk patient. Uh, we have a separate session for the sake of time. I want to remind folks that abuse, addiction, and misuse have, are three separate disorders. Misuse means the patient's not taking as directed. It may be accidental, it may be malicious, uh, but most patients don't take their drugs as prescribed. So misuse, particularly in older patients, means they're not taking them as often as you recommend. Abuse is a maladaptive pattern uh, of prescription opiate use leading to impairment or distress, and addiction is a chronic primary neurobiological disease. And it's very important to be able to make this definite diagnosis, and uh, Dr. Joe Merrill will give us an updated, a full didactic uh, using the uh, DSM-5 uh, criteria. Uh, and this is a bit outdated as well, and for that I apologize. And I'm not, uh, oops. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so in terms of making the diagnosis, you want to make a diagnosis. Is it nociceptive? Is it neuropathic? Is it depression, anxiety, or other mood-related disorder, or PTSD? or is there active uh, opiate use disorder present? The treatments, which we will speak to at another session, are very quick summary, no susceptible pain, short interval rest to allow tissues to heal, suture the laceration, splint the fracture, uh, nature will heal. Ice, often useful, NSAIDs, I did not include acetaminophen, but they should be included here as well, and Opioids are appropriate for acute nociceptive pain. Primary indication and appropriate use of opiates, acute nociceptive pain. Uh, neuropathic pain, tricyclic antidepressant drugs, SNRIs, the anti-epileptic or anticonvulsive drug categories, and opioids. Opioids, again, acute. Chronic recommendations are the first three. Uh, opioids become more and more problematic, as we know, with uh, uh, chronic use. Uh, in the setting of depression and anxiety, we don't use opiates and benzos. We try not to. It's remarkable how many patients arrive at the University of Washington uh, Center for Pain Relief, and I'm sure in your clinic, with uh, depression and anxiety being managed with benzodiazepines. They are not evidence-based treatments. For PTSD, uh, published evidence is antidepressants, particularly the SSRIs if you're using drugs. Uh, Off-label use would be prazosin, especially if there are nightmares present. It's an old blood pressure drug. Uh, it is a uh, 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 adrenergic antagonist, so it basically stops the adrenaline surge that patients will feel, and they will sleep much better, and typically will allow the antidepressant therapies to work more effectively. And cognitive behavioral therapy, or if available, uh, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, uh, which is a modification of that, and we will have a session on uh, management of PTSD by Dr. Carrie Stevens in the upcoming uh, weeks ahead. And if the patient has opiate use disorder, you do not treat with opioids because you will be non-compliant with DEA regulations uh, because uh, a patient with opiate use disorder, opiates are prescribed uh, only for acute pain, for the duration of that setting, that is permissible, but chronic use of opiates for opiate use disorder needs to be in a treatment program that uses medication-assisted treatment, such as methadone maintenance, uh, or buprenorphine, naloxone, or brand name Suboxone. 
Uh, abstinence may be reasonable, 92% chance of relapse. Uh, so this is out of the scope of uh, practice for too many folks because getting Suboxone trained uh, takes can be done now completely online at no cost to you to become able to manage opiate use disorder in your practice. And this is a major scourge right now, uh, partly on the basis of overprescribing of opioids uh, uh, and creating addiction problems, but is an independent process as well uh, and management in your office using uh, buprenorphine uh, and naloxone uh, combination products would be uh, highly recommended. So uh, in conclusion, in order to treat something, we must be able to make the diagnosis, learn to recognize it. Uh, uh, the diagnosis precedes our treatment decision Chronic pain is complex, and if you follow the, the brief outline of the structured approach uh, using the, uh, the uh, tools that we, we uh, provide, i.e. pain tracker, you will be able to uh, assess the uh, behavioral and social uh, components uh, of an individual's distress, and this will improve your diagnostic accuracy and improve your uh, ability to uh, properly uh, introduce therapies uh, that manage the social and psychological factors. And a thorough assessment of these domain adds important diagnostic and uh, uh, treatment uh, expectations. Uh, so uh, very brief run through, neuropathic, no susceptive pain, acute versus chronic, selecting therapies that match that, and don't forget the biobehavioral, excuse me, the behavioral and social uh, consequences uh, of the burden of chronic pain uh, that our patients experience and treat accordingly. Uh, uh, Cope REMS is up online still, and uh, Mark, that's going to continue to be posted online? Throughout the year, throughout 2016, it's still available and, and free to use. The <clears throat> free CME goes away the end of this month. Okay, so if you use it before March is over, you will be able to do it at no cost to well, you can collect the CME. Well, you can at no cost. The question is, can you get credit at yes. no cost? Yeah, and it's a three-hour training program. Uh, yeah, people, it takes various amounts of time, depending on how people go yeah, through it. But you'll get three uh, Category 1 yeah, CME three hours. Four. Yeah, uh, three to four, depending you can on... Get as much, you can get four. Four hours as well, okay. And, and that'll be free CME available at that site. Uh, and this is not just teaching you about uh, extended release long-acting opioids, which is what many of the uh, REMS courses do. This is about navigating the patient's request for extended release long-acting opioids and how to navigate away and provide non-opioid and often non-pharmacological management strategies as well. A typical UW ploy uh, to remember the Lozier onion, uh, that uh, pain is complex and the behaviors we see and the experiences of suffering we see uh, are often not related uh, to a condition uh, that is has any evidence-based support for using opiates and benzodiazepines. It's still a terrible scourge. Uh, uh, last year, 18,000 people died of uh, prescription opioid overdoses, a true epidemic, uh, and this is our effort to uh, alleviate that in some respect. Okay, so uh, thank you for your attention.